Okay, so I'm going to open up a document that's stored on Blackboard. And let's start here with this lab exercise. And I'm going to review some basics first. Okay, and this first basic problem is just a restatement of stuff we've been working on, working on all along having to do with populations. Normal distribution and use of the z-table of total cholesterol values for a certain population are approximately normal with a mean of 200 um, uh, per, per uh, deciliter and a standard deviation of 20 milligrams per deciliter. Find the probability that an individual picked at random from this population would have a cholesterol value of. Well, for starters, what are, we, what are we dealing with here? Are we dealing with a sample or are we dealing with a population? Okay, we're dealing with a population stated in the beginning of the problem. As it's stated in the beginning of the problem, total cholesterol value of certain, certain population are approximately normal and, and uh, uh, have a mean of 200 and a standard deviation of 20. Okay, so we're dealing with a, a uh, normal distribution. I'll draw that here. Okay, and that distribution has a mean of 200 and a standard deviation equal to 20. Okay, the first question that comes up is, um, uh, what's the probability that we would pick an individual at random from that population, and they would have a uh, cholesterol between 180 and 220? Well, we know we got lucky there because standard deviation is 20, and since we're looking at a value that's got a z-score of minus 1 and plus 1, we know that this is roughly 68 percent of the population. So since 68 percent of the population is between those two values, one standard deviation below the mean, one standard deviation above the mean, we know about 68 percent of it uh, 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 is, is within that group. Then we can say if we pick someone at random, there's a 68 percent chance that, the, uh, uh, that uh, uh, our picking them is going to occur. Okay, next question. Uh, what's the probability that they're between 160 and 240? Well, that's going to be another uh, negative two z, uh, z score negative two, or two standard deviations above and below the mean. So now we're dealing with 95% of the population. So our probability of picking someone is going to be 95%, 0.95. And finally, um, greater than 225 per 100 milliliters. Hmm, this was 220, so 225 is going to be about here, right? And we want to know what's the probability of picking someone that's greater than 225. So we're looking for this area right in here, greater than 225. So we want to calculate a z-score for that. In order to figure out what that area is, we need a z-score. We need to know how many standard deviations above the mean that that is. So it's going to be equal to 225 minus the mean, 200. So it's 25 over the z-score, over the mean, divided by the standard deviation, which is 20, right? So that's going to be equal to 1.25, one and a quarter, basically. Okay, that's our z-score. So this time, since I can't use the uh, uh, empirical formula to estimate the, this area, I'm going to have to use my z-table. So I'm going to open up a z-table. And um, uh, I'll get back to questions in a second if there are any. Uh, let's see if I have it here. Is my z-table from Agresti. Okay, and my z-table, uh, let's see, z-table is equal to, z is equal to 1.50. That's 93.3% 93, 93 of the population is going to be below that value. Right here's here's a, a little diagram shows us what areas these represent. There's a z-score 225, 93.3% of this population would be below here. Okay, or in other words, this area would be equal to 0.933. Okay, let me get something that's a little darker here so we can see it a little bit better. 0.933. Okay, that leaves this area, which is equal to 1 minus 0.933, right? So 7, this would be 9, so this would be 6, and we would 
carry that over. So we're getting this OV 0.067, 6.7, or probability equal to 0.067. So this would be 0 0.067, or as percent, it would be 6.7 percent. Usually, when you when you talk about probabilities, you usually describe it as a decimal proportion, 0 0.067. Same number, right? But just a better way to describe it. On the test, anytime there was a discrepancy between these, the automatic scoring scored you wrong. If, it, if I had asked for it as a decimal, it scored you wrong. But I went back over all the answers and make sure that um, uh, anyone that, that just just simply ignored the instructions and just simply uh, uh, describe it as a percentage and instead of a decimal or a decimal instead of a percentage when it's asked for. I made sure that those were all graded correct. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the DASI score is 1.25. Uh, it'd be 1. 1.25, right? Because it's 25 over 20. Everybody agree with that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I looked up 1.5. I, I said 1.25, and I looked up 1.25. I'm glad I went back and checked, right? Okay, so that's what happens when you can't yell at me. 1.20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's 0. 0.89. I'm going to call it 4. Okay, and let me get that out of the way. Uh, we were doing a seminar today on the uh, collapse, building collapse in East Harlem. That's why that picture popped up. Um, let's see, point, uh, point uh, what did I call it again? I, I think you guys, uh, point 0.8994. Oh, come back here. Point 0.899, okay. And so that would leave, uh, uh, we'd be subtracting point 0.899 from here. So that would be 1, 0, 1. Uh, that would be point 0.1. Zero, 0.1 or 10.1%. Again, talk about pro uh, probability. You probably would prefer to use that uh, uh, proportion. Okay, 10 point, uh, point, point, uh, um, uh, array, um, point, point 0.1056. Not 1056, but point 0.1056. Okay, so make sure you get the decimal point in the right place there. Okay, so now... Uh, let's move on to the next part of that, which is between 90 and 210. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get a fresh page here because it's getting a little messy. Let me go to another color. Okay, let's stick with black. Oh, I didn't change the color. Okay, it's okay. 200, and we're looking for. The probability of picking an individual between 90 and 210. So 90, oops, 190, excuse me, 190 and 210. So 190 is not going to be very far below the mean. Okay, here's 190. And here's 210 is going to be just a little bit above the mean. Okay, so we want to know what the probability is of picking someone in this area here, in here between between 190 and 210 milligrams. Okay, so now we know our Z table is only going to give us areas to the left of the value that we uh, assign, uh, that we look up for a Z score. So we're going to be only be able to use it to look up this area. So if I want this area, the strategy I might use is first to have it look uh, have it tell the area from 210 down, which would be illustrated here, and then find the area from 190 down and subtract it from the area from, for, from 210 down, leaving only the area in between them. Okay, so first I'll find this area from 210 down, and that's a z-score, 210 minus 200 over... Uh, 20 is equal to 0.5, okay, 10 over 20. And the z-score here is going to be equal to uh, 190 minus 200 over 20, which is going to be over minus 10 over 20 is equal to negative 0.5. Okay, so let's find those two areas. Let's go back to our z-score. 
a Z table. Oh. Get it to open again. Or at least pop up. Uh, it must be hidden back here somewhere. Come on. Oops, again. Oh, I know preview is opening up these other pictures. That's what's happening. Hmm. Yep, let me let me force preview to quit. So maybe we can get this thing working again. There we go. Okay, first thing I want is the area. Uh, from uh, 0.5 down to the le entire left side of the distribution, 69.15.6915. So that area represents a probability of 0.6915. And the area from uh, 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 190 down is negative 5, a, P a, uh, uh, a, a Z score of negative 0.5 is going to be negative 0.5 is going to be equal to 0.3085 point three zero so let's see the difference 0 0.6915 minus 0 0.3085 is going to be zero carry one let's see an eight there that's going to be three eight three so that's going to leave 38.3% of the population between those two. Probability of picking a person out at random between those two values is going to be 0 0.3830. Okay, good work. So, yeah, I see you guys doing it in the background. When I glance over into the chat box, I'm seeing you guys do it. And I appreciate the confirmation because, like I, like I said, I'm switching back and forth here. And uh, it's easy for me to, like, forget what numbers I'm working with uh, occasionally. So it gets a little crowded here. There's a control panel that you guys can't see that takes up uh, about a third of the screen on the right-hand side. So that's why I tend to see me tend to be working on the left-hand side more than uh, anywhere else. So also I have a tendency to just get scattered anyway. So this is not helping. Okay, so that's kind of a review on what we've done. And that deals with populations. Um, uh, if I had written on this table what the population, uh, if I had written uh, what the value of the mean here was, rather than just dumping at the bottom of the middle of the distribution, I would have said the mean is equal to 200, right? Use a Greek letter to represent the mean uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the entire population, which we can know in this case. And sigma represent the standard deviation. Greek letter represent the standard deviation. These would be called parameters, right? Because they're not, they're actual uh, values for the entire population. They're not sample values. If we had sample values, we would use, uh, uh, we wouldn't use Greek letters. We would use letters like X bar, X with a bar on top for the mean and SD for the standard deviation or something similar to that. Okay, so let's take a look at the next question that we have here. Now, we're going to apply that central limit theorem. The central limit theorem was if you recall, it tells us that if we take repeated samples from that population, whether it's this population or any population, especially if it's a normally distributed population, not doesn't always have to be normally distributed. That's one of the elements of central limit theorem, that if you take a big enough sample, uh, it's less and less important that the original population be perfectly normally distributed. But the other element of the simple central limit theorem is that we keep taking repeated samples from this population, we can start a new distribution that's made up from the means that we get every time we get a sample. So if we take repeated samples of size 100 from the population above, the standard deviation of, of this new population is going to be different than the, popula than the uh, uh, standard deviation for this population. Okay, The way it's going to be different is it's going to be equal to the standard deviation of the original population divided by the square root of the sample size, that 100. So we're going to take a look at that new distribution. Okay, and that new distribution is going to be much narrower than 
the one that we saw here for uh, the, the uh, population. Okay, the new distribution is still going to have a mean of 200, but it's going to be spread out much less than the original population. This is the distribution of all the samples of size 100 if you did, did it over and over and over again. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the questions based on that new distribution. What's the probability that the mean of the sample is larger than 202? Okay, let's take a look. If this were the populate, if we were dealing with the population, right, we would have gotten a very different answer here. Let's take a look at what might have happened here. If we were dealing with the population, uh, uh, well, I'm going to first draw the standard de deviation, the uh, normal distribution for the sample means. Okay, 200. The, the, the mean for all of these repeated samples of the population, the mean is going to approximate 200. Even, you know, even though it's now we're taking repeated samples of 100, they're still going to tend to cluster in the middle around 200. Now, what's going to change is the standard deviation. Standard deviation is going to be sigma over the square root of n. Uh, the standard deviation of the population, which is 20 over the square root of 100, which is 10. So 20 over 10 is going to be equal to 2. So now we were looking at what's the probability of, so standard deviation is 2. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because uh, what's going to happen here is, gee, one standard deviation is going to be uh, uh, plus 1 here. It's going to be 202. Two standard deviations is going to be 204. Three standard deviations is going to be 206. If we're looking at a number like 202, well, we're looking at a value that represents one standard deviation above the mean of all the samples in this case. Now, to distinguish between, yeah, uh, uh, Michelle is absolutely right, to distinguish between the standard deviation for the population and the standard deviation for re re repeated samples of the mean, we call this, instead of standard deviation, we call this the standard error of the mean. Okay, so we're using standard error is equal to 1. So standard error is equal to 202 minus 200, just like we did before, over, in this, in this case, the standard error, which is 2, so that's 2 over 2 is equal to 1. So that's one standard deviation. Well, just like before, right, we want to know what percentage below or above. What probability of sample is larger than 202? Well, the probability that if we took a sample of 100 people from this population, that that particular sample would be greater than that is going to be this area in here, which is one standard deviation above the mean. There's a couple of ways for me to do that. We remember that once, if we have a normal distribution, which this uh, sample distribution is also, uh, that one standard deviation below the mean, one standard deviation above would represent 68%. So half of that would be the 34% above the mean. The 50 plus the 34% above, 50% below the mean, uh, and, 50, and the 34% above would represent roughly 84% of the means that would be above that level or probability of 0.84. Okay, so, um, uh, so the standard error, remember, is equal to standard error for the means is equal to sigma, the standard area of population, which is 20, divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 100, that's 10, 20 divided by 10 then becomes 2. Okay. Uh, uh, two. So standard deviation is 2. And 202 would be one standard deviation. It would be two, 2 above 200. Okay, so here we are. We have that. The other way we could do this is just simply go to the Z table and look up the area for a Z score of 1. Okay, and let's see if we can't do that. A Z score of 1 would be equal to, would be equal to, where is it, 1? 0.8413. So a little bit more accurately, we would say using the z-table instead of 0.84, that it's actually equal to 0.8411. Okay, so that's really the only things that changed when we looked at how the sample means are distributed. Okay, but that's very powerful. 
that tells us a lot about how samples behave. And that's important to us because in statistics, in real life statistics, we very rarely know that much about the population. We're usually taking samples to discover things about the population. Knowing this, knowing the this property of me, of sample means helps us to understand when we take a sample, how price precise is our estimate of the mean. So I'm going to move on to the next part of this question. What's the probability that the uh, mean is between that the mean of samples between 198 and 202? Well, we know that 198 then would be one standard deviation below the mean, right? This would be 198, and that would be a z-score of minus one, right? Two, difference of two, that's the standard standard error is two. So we know that this area between is about 68%. I could use the z-table to do it more precisely. Thank you, guys, to do it more precisely, but I'm not going to bother because we, we're starting to understand the way that this works. If we took repeated samples of size 100 from, from this population, within what range would we expect 95% of the sample means to fall? First using the empirical rule and then using the z-table. So what, what range, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw this again. Whoops. Let me get this over here and get to a fresh page. Okay, and let me draw this. Here's our distribution of sample means. Standard error is equal to two. The mean is equal is equal to two the two hundred. Okay, within what range? Here's a mean right here is two hundred. Within what range of numbers would we expect ninety five percent of the population using of the of the sample means? Uh, I would expect what range of numbers would I expect that to occur? Okay, okay, negative two standard deviations. To plus two standard deviations. Well, what's the actual number for the means? What what would the, I would I would expect it to be 196. Very good, Jennifer. 196 to 204. That's the range that I would expect 95% of the values to occur. Well, let's think about this now. Let's do the same thing using the z-table. Well, you same thing using the z-table. 95% of the uh, uh, values for the mean. If I take repeated samples, are going to be in the middle. So that means outside of that's going to be two and a half percent on the bottom, and two and a half percent of the results are going to be above uh, 204. Okay, so what z score actually represents uh, that two and a half percent? We know 95% is a good estimate. We want to find out what that z score, that the exact z score is that represents the value where two and a half percent is below and two and a half percent is above. So I'm going to go to the Z table and instead of looking up the Z score in the columns and across in, uh, in the first column and across, I'm going to look up the area that represents the lower two and a half percent. And to do that, I have to go up to the negative numbers because I want to find the Z score where the area represents the lower two and a half percent here. So I'm going to skim through here until, let's see, two and a half. So I got one, 1 1.79, 2.28. It's before this. So it must be in this row right here. 179, let's see, where is it again? 2, 0 0.28, 0 0.22, 0 0.22, let's see. Oh, here, we, here we are right here. There it is right there. So the z-score that represents that area is not two, right? Two is, two is actually a little bit, uh, it is an area that's a little bit smaller than 2.5%. It's actually 1.96. Negative 1.96 is the z-score that represents that area. That z-score right here, right, z is equal to negative 1.96. Okay? And you probably have already guessed that this z-score at the top is going to be equal to positive 1.96. But let's check just to make sure. Okay, so this area is going to represent 2.5%, uh, but I can't look that up in the table, that area. I can only look at the area up from here down. Well, if this is 2.5%, that must be 97.5%, the remainder of the area below there. So let's go to our z-table and see if we can't look that up. 
Okay, pull that up. This time I'm on the positive side because I, I, I only, want, only want to catch the left two and a half two and a half percent. So I'm looking for 97.5. And there's 97.5 right there. And that is a z-score of plus 1.96. Same value. So if I wanted to know what the z-score is, that would represent 95% of the outcomes would be, it would be not a z-score of 2, the way the empirical formula, uh, the empirical estimation tells us, but a real, actual, real closer value of negative 1.96 to positive 1.96. But those are z-scores. Those are not the actual values. In this, in this particular example, what would be the actual value for cholesterol that would represent the range, middle range of 95% of these samples if we took them over and over again? Well, that's going to be a little bit difficult. If I had used 2 for the z-score, that would have been easy. We just did it, not 196 to 204. Two standard deviations below uh, 200 and two standard deviations above. That was pretty easy to do. Well, now, because it's not precisely two and we want a more exact number, we have to look at it this way. It's really 200, right? And on this side, we're going to subtract two standard deviations, not two standard deviations, but 1.96 standard deviations times the number two, the standard deviations. Two, point, uh, two times two would have been four, so that would have been 196. But now we know that more precisely, the number that represents 95% of the outcomes uh, uh, being in the middle is going to re is going to be equal to 1.96 times two, 1.96 times two, and we know that that's going to be equal to 3.92. Okay, so this is going to be 3.92 below 200. Okay, so 3.92 below below two, uh, 200 is going to be 196.08. Am I right about that? 190. I'm sorry. Point uh, point eight two. Point nine two. One nine. Hang on a second. That's going to be three. What did I say? That was three point uh, 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 two. All right. Three point nine two. Uh, 196.08. I got to erase this so I can actually see something here. 200 minus uh, 2 point, uh, uh, 196 times, times 2 is going to be 4 less 0 0.04, which is going to be 3.9, uh, uh, 0.92, correct? So that's going to be 1. 96.08, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I, and yet, that's the answer you guys got. Okay. Now, on the positive side, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be 200 plus 1.96 times 2, or 200 plus 3.92. So it's going to be 196.08 to uh, uh, 200 and 3.92. Let me pull that back out here, 0.92. Okay, so that range represents 95% of the outcomes that I would expect from this distribution, knowing that the standard deviation of the population was 20, that the sample size was 100, and that the mean of the population, sigma, was equal to 100. All, that, all this was deduced from that starting point and the central limit theorem. Okay, so now this is pretty interesting, right? And if we took a sample of 100 people, uh, of 100 people from this population, we know, we, we're predicting that 95% of the time that they would come between these two numbers. I'm going to restate that another way. If we take, a, if we go to the original population, we take a sample of 100 people, I'm 95% confident that the real population, that, that, that I would get a value between these two values. Let's say for a moment, I don't know. I, I took a sample of 100 in this situation. I didn't know that the original mean was 200, 
right? Well, in this case, if I took a sample of 100 people, got a mean of 200 from my sample, right? And I happen to know the population standard deviation. Uh, trust me now, we're going to need it for the time being, but we're going to get around that pretty soon, okay? Uh, I'm Another way of saying this would be for me to say I'm 95% sure that the true population mean is between 196.08 and 203.92. Instead of describing this as a specific population, as a specific uh, uh, value for this population, I'm saying that I don't know what the population mean is, but I'm 95% sure it's between these two numbers. This property of the central limit theorem and the way samples uh, work allow me to take a new pot, a new set, a new uh, analysis. Let me see if I got one here. Da, 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 okay. Uh, this one's a sample size of 25. I don't want to repeat that again. Okay. I'm going to take this next question and it's going to clarify this idea of using this to calculate a level of confidence. Okay. Let's see. Sample 100 bottles of detergent and find that on average, the bottle will be sufficient for 57 loads. Okay, take 100 cents. This is a sample of 100 bottles of detergent. And some bottles took, you know, they were good for 50, 64, 59, so on and so forth. But on average, you got 57 loads out of them. You know, the standard DVH of the entire production of 100,000 bottles is, is um, uh, 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 the, the entire standard deviation is equal to five bottles per load. That's sigma. That's uh, the standard deviation for the entire population. So what do I know here? I know that my sample mean, my sample mean X bar is equal to, what did I say, 57? 57. My population standard deviation is equal to five. Anybody remember what my sample size was? How many bottles did I sample? 100 bottles of detergent. Okay, so without drawing a graph, without drawing a graph right now, if I look at my re at repeated samples of so size 100, right, I say to myself, you know, I think the mean is 57. That's what I got when it took a sample of 100. Do I know what the population mean is here? Has anyone told me what it is? Do, do I know for sure it's 57? In fact, it probably is not exactly 57, right? We don't know what it is. We only know what the sample mean is. We're lucky in that we know that the standard deviation of the population is 5. That allows us to figure out what's the probability that we would get a, uh, a, a mean from a sample of size 100 that's less than the mean, the population mean, and more than the population mean. So it allows me to calculate a standard error for this sample, standard error is going to be equal to 5 divided by the square root of 100. 5 divided square root of 100, that's 5 over 10, is going to be equal to 1 half. Okay, so my sample size is 100, allowed me to calculate a standard error for repeated samples of size 100. Now, do I know the population mean? No, I don't. However, what I can predict that if I look at this and I say to myself, gee, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's close to 57. I'm going to look at that as the mean. And I'm going to say, uh, my, I'm 95% confident. Okay, I'm 95% confident that the real population mean is somewhere between, well, I'm going to say X bar plus or minus Right? I'm going to add to it uh, two standard deviations, two times the standard error. So I'm going to say I'm 95% sure it's equal to X bar plus two standard errors, two standard deviations for the samples, or negative two standard deviations for the samples. Well, let's be more precise. We know it's not really two. It's really 1.96 times the standard error. So let's fill in the numbers that we know. The sample mean that I took was 57, plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error for repeated samples for, from this population, where the original population had a standard deviation of 5, and the, and the sample size was 100. 
So that's going to be times 0.5, right? One half. So what does this come out to? Well, let's multiply it out. Get our calculator out. 1.96, whoops, 1.96 times 0.5 is equal to about 1, or actually 0 0.098. So it's 57 plus or minus 0 0.98. So it's going to be, let's see, the range I have here is going to be from 56, that's 0.98, from 56.02 to 57.98. I'm predicting that 95% of the time that the mean will actually be, the real population mean, even though I don't know it, that 95% of the time I will get it right, that I will capture the real population mean between these two numbers. That's called a confidence interval. Okay, that's the idea of the confidence interval. Do you guys, does that make sense to you? The way we use the central limit theorem to, to expand our understanding about how sample means are distributed, how the standard error is related to the standard deviation of the real population. And now, now, when we take a sample from any population, that we can, if we know the, the, the population standard deviation, that we now can take the mean that we got from our sample, whatever size it happened to be, calculate a standard error, multiply it by 1.96 and add it, subtract it, so that we get a range which gives us a level of confidence of 95% of the time, we're actually going to have the real mean in between those two, even though we don't know what the real mean is when we start off. So let me get a couple of comments there. Does that make sense to you? Well, let me know if, if you're uneasy about that, if there's some part of that that doesn't make sense to you. Or at least type something in so I know you can still hear me. Okay, it's probably pretty reasonable, right? This is really powerful. Think about this now. What this means is, is that when I take a sample, whatever, whether it's size 100 like it is here, or whether it's size 25, or whether it's size, when I take a sample and I find the average for that sample, before we did this, we were out in left field. We knew the average for the sample was a certain number, we have a you know a pretty good feeling that when you take a sample, especially if you take a big sample, that you're getting pretty close to the population mean, but we couldn't quantify our level of certainty. Now we have a way that we can quantify our level of certainty, and that's called a confidence interval. Now let me ask you something. If I asked you, I'm going to take a look at this. See this number that we use for the z-score for 95% confidence, right? What if I told you that I want to be more confident than that? So I'm going to, instead of using 1.96, I'm going to use 2.58. If I use 2.58, right? If I use 2.58, add and subtract times the, the uh, standard error, that makes this, this, the, 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 these two numbers further apart. It makes my confidence interval wider. In fact, this is the number instead of 1.96 that you would use if you want a 99% confidence interval. Why 99? How do I get to that from 2.58? Well, if I look at the, if I look, I saw the questions over, I saw a long comment there and I'm going to get to it in a second. If I uh, look at that z-score, negative and positive 2.58, negative 2.58, where is it? Negative 2 point, move it here. Negative 2.50123456. Well, 2.58 is around half of 1%. That means a half of 1% on this end and half of 1% on that end for plus 2.58. That means you capture 99% of the possible outcomes, right? So that means that's how we got to using this number 2.58 instead of 1.96 gives me a wider interval 
but I'm more confident that I can catch the that I can catch the mean. Since the numbers are further apart, it makes sense that this less likely that the mean would be lower or higher than those numbers because we got a wider range. Now, if I asked you about uh, what about if I wanted to calculate a 90% confidence interval, would the range of numbers be closer together would be a smaller spread or a wider spread for a 90% confidence interval? They would be closer together. If they're closer together, you're less confident. And if you go to the Z table to look up, well, 90% means 5% on one end and 5% on the other end is excluded. So 90% confidence interval, you'd be using the Z score 1.64. And if you go back there, I'm not going to do it now, but if you go back there and look, negative 1.64 is going to represent an area of 5% on a normal distribution, and positive is going to be an area of 95% to the left of that, or 5% to the right. So that's how I'm going to, that's why I'm going to use 1.64 instead of the uh, the uh, uh, 1.96 or 2.58. Usually, we are looking for a 95% confidence interval. Most of the time, that's what you're, you'll see in studies and so on and so forth. And a lot of times, if you have a study in the abstract, if, if it involves numerical a numerical variable, and they calculate a mean for a population, they'll almost always give you some perspective on how precise that answer is. And they'll say, oh, well, you know, 95, um, the blood lead level for children in the Bronx uh, in this neighborhood was uh, 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 4.3 micrograms per deciliter, right? Confidence interval in parentheses, 3.7 comma 11.2 or something like that. Right, so they will give you a range that represents their uh, represents a range in which they're ninety five percent sure of the true mean. You remember their their average was just a sample average, but given the variability and so on and so forth, that's what they're predicting uh, the real sample mean for all children for all the children in that population that they sampled a subset of uh, would be. So let me go back and just take a look at some of these questions that came up. But the dynamic percent of the mean sample. Let's see. Population mean. Population. Oh, okay. That's a good question. Jennifer raised an important point. Um, when uh, when I was describing that in the using central limit to describe uh, a, a sample, uh, we had a population where we knew the mean to start off with. And we knew that the mean was equal to 200, and we knew that the standard deviation was equal to 20. We could then draw a, a sample distribution, a distribution of all the sample means that we understand precisely. We know what the probabilities are exactly because we understand what how, how, how the uh, central limit theorem tells us how all the outcomes are going to be distributed. However, that's only if we really know the sample mean to start out, the, the population mean to start out with. More often than not, we're not in that situation. I just use that to illustrate the logic behind using uh, a standard error and the, these specific Z source for developing a range uh, of which where you would expect these sample, repeated samples to fall. But in reality, when we don't know this, the population mean, the only thing we can rely on for estimating the population mean is what we get as a sample mean, right? So, so uh, uh, if I, I I would not describe this knowing that that mean may not be the real population mean, I would not describe this in a way that would say that oh here's 57. I know the population standard deviation, so my confidence interval is 56 to 58. So I would not say. Well, I expect 90, if I keep going and sampling that population, I would not say I'd expect the sample means to come out uh, to 95% of the, if I repeat the additional samples that I take, means that the additional samples, I wouldn't say that I would expect them 95% of the time to be between 56, 56 and 58, because I'm not sure that that's really the sample mean. I would, if, if somebody came, oh, you know, the real mean is really 50, 57.5. I would expect that to be true if I knew the real population mean. But since I don't know that, the best I can say is, is that, you know, I may not know the way the rest of the other samples may come out, 
But if I start with the assumption that I'm reasonably close to the population mean, or this is an estimate of the population mean, I can then use the confidence interval to give me an idea of how certain I am that uh, I, ha I know what the population mean is. I may not know it as an exact number, but I know it as a range that I'm 95% sure the real population mean will be in. Okay? So it's a little bit, there's a fine line, there's a fine distinction there, but really the confidence interval gives us a range that we're 95% sure captures the, the uh, confidence interval, uh, it captures the real population mean. Okay? Uh, you're going to be wrong 5% of the time though, aren't you? Right, because that's just the nature of the beast. If you don't like being wrong ninety-five percent uh, of the time, well, then you go to the ninety-nine percent confidence interval. Do you ever know for sure? Could, could you ever give me a range that there's zero chance that you would be wrong? Well, yeah, it'd be zero to infinity. That would be the range where you'd have zero chance of being wrong. But you make some sort of reasonable compromise. Ninety-nine percent is a really good level of certainty. Even ninety-five is a pretty good level of certainty. Why is this so important? Well, one of the reasons why this is so important is that we may run into a situation where, for instance, and we're getting off a little bit into what we'll be looking at in the future, where we sample 25 children in the Bronx, and we find that the average uh, 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 blood lead level in the Bronx is 4.2, and we sample 25 children in Brooklyn. And we find the average blood lead level in Brooklyn is 3.6. Well, remember, this is a sample of size 25, not a real big sample in either one of these. There's a certain amount of variability here. And we'll know that very, you know, we'll know, oh, gee, the range here, we got, we got some kids that were 11, some kids that were 2, some 0. We'll know the level of variability in here. So since this is a sample, we don't know what mu is. Mu is unknown for both of these, mu for the Bronx and mu for Brooklyn. We don't know what they are. But what we can calculate here, uh, if we know the population standard deviation, we can calculate it really accurately. If we don't know it, we can guess at it from the standard deviation of the samples that we took, right? And that's, a stand, not, that's not standard error, that's standard deviation, just like it, we estimate sample standard deviation to mean. But that's not as precise as knowing the popula if you know the population. So we're, for right now, for this week, we're only dealing with situations where we know the population standard deviation. You don't have to worry about that. The point is, is that because of the variability, the standard deviation, the variance that all these numbers have, right? This sample mean, a sample of 25 people, is not the real blood lead level for all the kids in the Bronx. But it can help us as provide a 95% certainty. So for instance, I might say, well, it's 4.2, but the 95% confidence interval is 2.1 to uh, 6.3. That I'm 95% sure based on how the standard deviation of variability that the real true population mean for children in the Bronx is 2.1 to 6.3. And for Brooklyn, based on the variability in that borough of the blood lead levels. Well, that one is uh, 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 3.0 to uh, 4.2, right? Well, you want to know something? These two ranges overlap. I'm 95% sure that the, the true population mean uh, uh, for the Bronx is between 2.1 and 6.3. I'm 95% sure the true population mean for Brooklyn is between 3 and 4.2. And I said, gee, a minute ago, I thought I knew that the Bron children in the Bronx had a higher blood lead level than children in Brooklyn. But I didn't really know, did I? I only knew what was true for that sample. When I take a closer look and say, you know, I don't need to know just that number. I need to know how accurately I know that number. Let's calculate a confidence interval. Well, based on that number and the numbers that I derived it from, all I know is that the real population mean is between these two numbers, real population between these two numbers. Since they overlap, it's possible that Brook that children in Brooklyn could have a low, it's possible now, not, not very likely, but possible, you know, that 
that uh, uh, children in Brooklyn could have a lower blood lead level on average than children in the Bronx. Or it's possible that children in the Bronx could have a lower blood lead level than children in Brooklyn. So I can't say with 95% certainty, which is like what we like to have, at least in statistics, I can't say with that level of certainty that these numbers are different, that one is greater than the other. Okay, now I'm, I'm really kind of like, I'm taking a little bit of liberty with the way a statistician would describe the confidence interval and how you would use it to distinguish between two groups. You know, this would this might send a couple of, uh, they, they would tolerate it probably, it might send a few shivers up the spine of, you know, a couple of like really professional statisticians. But I think that this kind of like, and this is like, I would say that this, even though it's not probably not the best way to state it, this is reasonably true. Okay. So, so I, you know, so this gives us an opportunity to take two numbers and two means or a single mean and really understand how precisely that we know it. And that allows us to compare one group to another group so that, you know, uh, so instead of just comparing the mean, uh, uh, which we really don't know what the population mean is, we have a way of kind of guessing at whether or not we have enough of a difference between the two means that we found in the two groups to say that they're really different than one another. Okay. So does that make sense to you? That Are you starting to see where we're going with this? Pretty soon, we're going to be talking about doing experiments, doing studies. And in these studies, we're going to set up what are called hypotheses. Okay. So these hypotheses are going to involve things like Gee, um, um, uh, I think that children in the Bronx have higher blood lead levels than children in Brooklyn. So we're going to set up a study, and I'm going to say, gee, I'm going to start out with a something called a null hypothesis. I'm going to say to start out with, null means you know zero or no difference, for instance. Okay, my null hypothesis, my starting point is, there's no difference between the blood lead levels of children in the Bronx and the blood lead level of children in Brooklyn. That's my null hypothesis. I'm going to say, I'm going to try and disprove that and say that there really is a difference. That's going to be my alternative hypothesis. And my, my null hypothesis might be stated as the mu for children in the Bronx, the mean for children in the Bronx, is equal to the mu for children in Brooklyn. And my alternative hypothesis is that the mean blood lead level for children in the Bronx is not equal to the mean blood lead level of children in Brooklyn. Well, how am I going to prove that? How am I going to show that this is wrong and reject that and that this is right? Well, one of the ways I can do it, or one of the basis for the ways, maybe not the way, but the basis for the ways, is to show that the mean that I got from my sample, I'm 95% sure that it's so different. Let's say that it's uh, it's 2, 2.2, to 4.7, right? And the mean for Brooklyn and the confidence interval for Brooklyn was 1.2 to uh, 1.9. Well, now there's no overlap between them. So I'm 90, since I'm 95% sure the mean for the Bronx is between these two numbers and I'm 95% sure the mean for Brooklyn is between these two numbers, I can say, hey, I'm 95% sure that the means for each of them are different from one another. So I can reject this idea and accept this idea. I can say with a level of certainty that even beyond just knowing the means, I can say with a level of certainty that I can say that these the average for the populations are different in these two groups. Okay, so I don't know if that's stunned silence. Nobody's typed anything in in a while. So I can't tell from here. I can't, you know, usually in class I can see eyes glaze over or uh, uh, you know, people nodding or, you know, the heads hitting. I can hear the heads hitting the desk and stuff like that, but I have all the microphones muted, so I can't get that. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, that some of this, that, that this is getting through because this, this is really starting to get interesting. This is really starting to turn into real statistics. Okay, so let me just go back here.